All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the AuthorTube Writing Conference. Um, I have a pre-recorded video for you all today that I'm going to play. But before then, I just wanted to say hello and welcome everyone. First things first, um, since this is a pre-recorded video, in the video, I say that you have a certain amount of time allotted to do the step that I'm on. Um, but the times will be a little bit different because I had to edit the video down so that I can stay under the allotted time. So I think I am live. Let me know if you can see and hear me. I think so. I don't want to pull up the screen and mess anything up. Um, because I talked a lot in this video, I'm just going to go ahead and play my presentation. Let me just double check and make sure that everything is good. If you all can let me know if you can see and hear me okay. Okay. Everything is good. Oh, there's the know. echo. If you can see. Okay. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to go ahead and start our presentation. Again, if you have any questions, please leave them in the chat and we will go ahead and get started. Good time zone, everyone, and welcome to the AuthorTube Writing Conference 2022. My name is Morgan Lee, and you are here on my channel. Tonight, we will be discussing writing diverse characters. Before we begin, please be sure to grab a pen and a piece of paper or a blank document, as this will be an interactive session. Just as a reminder, there will be a Q&A portion at the end of this video, so if at any point you have a question, feel free to leave it into the live chat, and I will make sure to star it so that we can back to it during the Q&A portion of the video. There is a lot of information to cover today, so I will be speaking from my own personal experience as a Black, disabled, autistic woman, so all of my examples throughout my presentation will be to that effect. For the interactive portion of this video, we will be creating a character profile based on what we learn from all of the four points during this presentation. On the next slide, I'm going to present you with six basic character bios. All they have on them is your character's name, their age, their diverse identity label, and a story genre. We are going to take that basic profile and we're going to fully fledge it. We're going to add depth and diversity throughout the entirety of this presentation. If it gets a little confusing, hopefully the example that I have provided at each step will give you some insight into what I mean when I am trying to get you to work through each step. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide so we can get into this. Here I have the six character profiles for you to choose from. Don't worry if it's not a genre you're familiar with. The goal of this workshop presentation is for you to get a little bit out of your comfort zone, write characters that you normally maybe wouldn't write. So pick one that is maybe most distinct from you or something you don't have a lot of experience with. We're going to take them from this basic profile into fully fledged. At the end of each of my four talking points, you will have three minutes to work on adding depth and diversity based on the point that we had talked about previously. So I'm going to go ahead and be quiet for a few minutes so that you can get your character selected. And then once I feel everyone is ready to go, we will move on into the meat of our presentation. All right, so if everyone already has their characters selected, we're going to go ahead and move on to the presentation. I will be speaking on four main points. The first point being existence versus experience, stereotypes and harmful tropes, gnome and avoidum, tokenism, the imaginary diversity quota, and intersectionality. 
before we dive into all of the goodness of that, we need to lay a groundwork and a foundation. What is diversity and why does it matter? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines diversity as the condition of having or being composed of differing elements, especially the inclusion of different types of people, such as people from different races or cultures in a group or organization. Dispersed along the page, I have different areas of diversity that can exist, like race, gender, ethnicity, culture, disability, and sexuality, though there are other layers to diversity as well. Also on the screen, I have my top three reasons for why diversity ma matters in fiction. The first one being that representation matters and giving readers someone to see themselves in makes them feel less alone, makes them feel like their voices are heard. The second reason that I feel diversity is important is because I love learning about the lives and the challenges and the different cultures of people who are not like me. And then the last reason that I have is that the world is not a monolith. The world is colorful and I believe our fiction and our media in general should be as colorful as the world is and no one deserves to be erased. Feel free to let us know in the comments why you feel that diversity is important. Moving on, we are going to go into some fears and hesitations that I have heard from writers when it comes to the topic of diversity being this big, scary, looming thing. The first excuse that I've heard is that a lot of people don't think that it's that important or they're angry at people telling them that they have to do something. So they bulk at it and say, it's not that important. We, I don't need to do that. And to that, I would say that I hope by the end of this presentation, I show you how important that it is and that it's, it's beneficial not only to the audience reading it, but to the writer as well. The second excuse that I often hear is, but I'm not fill in the blank. I don't have a right to tell about this person or write about them because if I do it wrong, people will attack me. And to that I say, not entirely wrong because there will be some people that will feel that you don't have the right to say this or right to tell this person's story in the way you did. We'll get into more of that later. But my rebuttal to that is that your voice matters as well. There is care that needs to be taken when you are writing diverse characters, but you need to open yourself up to learning and making mistakes. But if you make mistakes, you need to learn from them and grow and move forward. And then the last excuse that I have heard was wanting to be historically accurate, that fill in the blank wasn't a thing during that time or in that location. And to that, I would say, I'm no history buff, but I'm pretty sure that whatever group of people you were wanting or thinking about including was not just invented. So I'm pretty sure that they were there somewhere at some point. Research needs to be dug a little bit deeper because erasure and othering is a real problem. With all of these excuses and fears in mind, what other hesitations or fears come to mind for you when you are writing diverse characters? Leave us notes in the comments and discuss with your other writers and see what everyone else is thinking. All of these fears and hesitations are valid. So should you be afraid of writing diverse characters? In my humble opinion, yes. Yes, you should be afraid of writing diverse characters, but that fear is not an excuse not to have them. Fear is not necessarily a bad thing. Fear means that you care about something. I was terrified of doing this presentation, but I could have emailed Shannon and said, I'm not doing it. But what value would that have added to my life or to anyone else's life? The consequences of portraying marginalized characters poorly is huge. And that is something to be, you know, cognizant of and, and maybe fearful of or hesitant of, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. Throughout this presentation, I hope that I am, I'm building your confidence a little bit that with the right mindset, the right tools and a desire to improve your skills as a writer, that fear and hesitation can wash away. And that including more diversity in your story doesn't cost you anything. And in my opinion, will make you a better writer, creating better characters because you'll be creating people that people can relate to. Writing diverse characters is not about slapping a race on them or slapping a sexuality on them and calling it diversity. It's not that. It is, it is deeper than that. And we'll learn that as we continue to go on. So how do you weigh the scary waters of diversity and write amazing diverse characters? The answer is a writer's favorite thing, which is research. Name me a writer who doesn't like research. Maybe there's some in the comments, I don't know. But you need to research just like we do for any other aspect of our story, 
we need to put the same care into learning our characters. I want to reiterate, you will also need to practice and be okay with being wrong. Sometimes you have to learn through the mess. You need to learn the value of having CPs and betas and alphas and sensitivity readers that you can depend on to let you know when you're messing up and to let you know how you can maybe adjust and fix and teach you something that you might not have known. With these relationships though, we need to remember that it is give and take. It is something that you ask for, not something that you expect your diverse friends to do for you. But if you build those relationships, if you have that writing group, if you have that critique partner, you can turn to and ask them about these things that, that might reflect their diverse identity. Don't expect the free labor or the free education. You need to do your research for one. That is the first step. And then also lean on to the friends in the writing community that you trust and that you've built a reciprocal give and take good friendship relationship with and learn. The other two community, especially I feel, is a loving community that is consists of writers who want to help each other, who want people to grow. So in my opinion, we will let you mess up privately so you don't mess up publicly. So you don't publish a book that has blatant racism or blatant sexism or blatant you know, homophobia in it. And that is what I will say at this point. Okay, now we're going to get back into your character that you selected at the beginning. The million dollar question, in my opinion, that I feel every writer needs to ask themselves when they are thinking of a character that has this diverse label. Am I the person to tell this story? And is this about my character's experience or about their existence? So we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means. Existence I define as the story simply being about your diverse character living their everyday lives, interrupted by a story world problem, and then everything goes crazy. The focus of the story is the story world problem. It's the crazy thing that happened that jacked up their lives. It is not about that person's diverse label. For example, a disabled man has to find out who killed his family before he is framed with their murder. A black teenager finds a secret portal to the underworld. The story is about the portal to the underworld. The story is about the murder and finding out who did it. It is not about that man being disabled. It is not about that teenager being black. It is about their existence because diverse people exist. Experience, on the other hand, dives more into an introspective, deep, most likely own voices type of story. Uh, the story is about a deep introspective look at that aspect of your character's diverse label as their diverse label affects them. So an autistic character placed in a group home, struggles with finding their independence, former Christian experiences church abuse, and the story is about their healing through that. Experience stories are ones that I feel are harder to write and take more intense, in-depth research because you're trying to emulate an experience that wasn't your own. You're trying to feel feelings that you have never felt. And while you can do it, you if you put in all of the work, you can write these stories. But the question still remains, are you the right person to tell it? And bonus question, are you willing to do the work to tell it well? As we think about that, we need to think back to our characters that we have selected at the beginning. First things first, we are going to think about a story that could encapsulate this character. So with your genre, I want you to write down some story ideas you might have with this character as the protagonist. So we're not thinking about their diverse identity unless you're writing an experience story. Up to you. First, answer the question, are you writing about their experience or their existence? My example, I chose the contemporary story with Noel as the main character, 14 or 14 years old and he is gay. The story idea I came up with was that Noel and his two best friends go on a cross country road trip chaperoned by his older sister for one last hurrah before one of his best friends moves out of the country. Along the way, the three friends plan to document their once in a lifetime excursion by creating a graphic novel. And it is going to be a friends to lovers story. So that is what I came up with. Contemporary real life things happening. It is about the trip. It is about the friends. It is about the experiences along the way. And it is just about his existence as a boy. So let us, okay, so I'm going to give you the three minutes for you to flesh out your character.
All right, so time is up for the first point. I hope you got some good story ideas down for your character. So we're going to move on to the next point, which is stereotypes and harmful tropes. Know them and avoid them. So for this point, I wanted to make sure that I that I say how how deeply stereotypes are ingrained just into our culture from things we've watched as kids, from movies, from from everything. So on the screen, I have different areas of things you might want to research when you are crafting your, your diverse character. So based on the character that you chose, these are things that you might want to research that might be different from other people or from yourself. And these are also areas in which stereotypes can exist. What is really important in this point is to realize that what is the difference between a stereotype and something that is could be cultural, like a universal experience. So we're going to do a little in-between exercise here. We are going to check our biases. And I thought that this would be important because I feel like because of how deeply ingrained some stereotypes and tropes and beliefs are just in our culture, that things we might think are okay end up not being okay if we were to talk to the people in, in that community or things that might even seem like good stereotypes. You know, what's the harm in the good stereotypes? Things like that. So we are going to check our biases. So on your piece of paper, please not in the comments because I don't want to unnecessarily offend anyone, um, but I want you to write down the stereotypes and tropes that come to mind in regards to your selected character. So for me, I selected Noel, who is gay. I would write down the stereotypes that, that I either not believe, but the stereotypes that I can think of when, when, I, when I hear that. Or even if you don't think, if you can't think of anything, you can Google them. I also Googled some. So you can do that as well. And this is just to get you kind of thinking about different, how different stereotypes and the dangers of perpetuating them. So I'm going to give you just about 20, 30 seconds for this one. You can do more on the three minutes at the end, but kind of got to keep it going. Okay, so in this section, I wanted to highlight some common tropes from three of my own diverse identity labels. So we're going to look at autism being black and being disabled. So the two tropes, and I just stuck with tropes, which tropes, stereotypes kind of go hand in hand a little bit. I picked two tropes of autism and the first one being Hollywood autism. So these are the Sheldon Coopers, the guy from The Good Doctor, the guy from Atypical. I haven't seen any of these shows. Uh, so, so yeah, those would be, you know, Rain Man. Uh, what do all of these characters have in common? They're white, they're men, they're geniuses or savants. They don't have any kind of emotion or empathy. And that is the picture of, of autism, according to Hollywood. And then tragically autistic, you have depicted, you know, lower functioning autistic people and the frame, the, the lens is focused on the family and how the family is struggling to deal with this autistic person and this autistic person can't do anything for themselves. They're so helpless and they're such an inspiration because they tied their shoe and all of this other thing and, and infantilizing. Those are common tropes in autism. And then for common tropes for, for being Black, I have the Black best friend trope, uh, the Black guy dies first, and tropes about Black women. Black best friend is usually under underdeveloped, is in the background of a story, and usually centered around a white character, and the race is their entire character. Black guy dies first, self-explanatory, and then some stereotypes about Black women is the strong Black woman trope, the angry Black woman. They're usually hypersexualized, or the mammy trope where they're the caretakers. Those are some common tropes for Black people. And then we have disability tropes. So I have the magical healing, inspirational or inspiration porn, and villain or evil. So what does all of that mean? Like, what is the harm? What's the harm in saying a disabled person is so brave for dealing with what they're dealing with? What's the harm in saying that, um, what's the harm in killing the black guy first? What's the harm 
in infantilizing autistic people. The harm is that it makes the world see us, see them as other. It, it puts up a barrier between the, I guess, the majority and then the other thing. So, for example, autism and um, allistic people. Allistic people, which means people without autism, see autistic people as ch- as children, even adult autistic people. They see us as childlike and less than human and helpless and um, aggressive because they don't understand like why we why why we stim or get or have meltdowns. For black people, if you say all black men are are thugs and all black women are are angry and hypersexualized that leads black women to, you know, being um, victims of sexual assault and black men ending up dead in the streets and disabled people. If you are saying that, oh, they're, they're faking this, or they don't look like this person on TV. So that means they're faking or they're entitled to having all of these, this special treatment. And then, you know, doctors don't believe that, you know, disabled people are sick or they don't look disabled because they don't have a wheelchair or they stood up from their wheelchair. So they don't need it. And it just leads to a lot of othering, a lot of of blaming, a lot of invalidation, and basically dehumanization. So the harm in perpetuating these stereotypes is that it is dangerous for the people who you are misrepresenting. If we keep saying that autism autism is only cis white males, then Black little girls are not going to get the support that they need. Black little boys, Hispanic little boys and girls are men, people not to be gendered, but people are not going to get the help that they need. And it, especially if you say it's all men, then any female presenting person or AFAP person is not going to get the help that they need. And that is very dangerous. So there is a lot of harm in perpetuating stereotypes and tropes so that we need to be observant of the ones that exist and how we can stay away from them in our fiction. All right, so we talked about a lot of things. So here are some notes on working against stereotypes and tropes. To do your research, ignorance is not bliss. You cannot say, I didn't know. It is 2022. There's no way that you could not know. Second note is to talk to the community. Be a part of the conversation. Learn from people. Don't expect everybody to teach you but learn from the people who are presenting that information to you and to the public. Third one is that practice makes perfect. So my suggestion, just like any other writing skill, it needs to be crafted. You need to learn how to craft better characters. So you're not going to do that automatically all of the time. It's going to take practice. And the last kind of most important thing, one of the most important things, all of these are important, is to hire sensitivity readers emphasis on the hiring part that sensitivity readers should be paid. Hire sensitivity readers in order to let you know if something you're saying or something you're portraying is problematic. All right, I said a lot of things. So it is now your turn again. You're going to bring it back to your character. Take another three minutes and write a small description of your character, avoiding the stereotypes and tropes you wrote down and or the ones that we discussed. So now we're diving more into your character, giving them a description, maybe a background, making sure that we avoid stereotypes and tropes. On this slide, I have my example. So in the corner, I just moved up my story idea. And then on the other side, I have the common stereotypes that I Googled or that I knew. I came up with a background for my character, trying to avoid any kind of tropes. And here is your three minutes to further flesh out your character.
All right, so time is up on that. And we are moving on to the third section of my presentation or seminar today, and that is tokenism and the imaginary diversity quota. Remembering to ask ourselves, is this your story to tell? And is this about your character's existence or experience? Okay, so first we need to give a basic definition. What is tokenism and what is the imaginary diversity quota? Basic dictionary definition, tokenism is the practice of making only a symbolic effort to do a particular thing, especially by recruiting a small number of people from underrepresented groups in order to give the appearance of racial equality or sexual equality. So tokenism is merely just having something or someone there to say that they're there. So think black best friend, gay best friend, the Asian nerd, things like that. They are a token character that merely exists to be that token. So it is a common misconception, I feel, among writers that if they just toss in a bunch of different characters with different diverse identities, that that will absolve them from having to write them well. And it, it's often even more harmful than if you were to ch check off boxes saying, I got my disabled character, I got my black character, I got my Asian character, I got my um, Hispanic character, I'm good, I, I've reached the quota, I have enough. There is no quota. When you're thinking about having to have enough, that only leads to the perpetuation of stereotypes and erasing cultures also reducing diverse characters to plot devices. So you're just creating cardboard cutouts, essentially, caricatures, making the barista black and everyone else in your story white. Tis not diversity, <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you. And this I don't understand. If you're taking the time to craft your stories and craft your characters, I don't know why crafting diverse characters is a step too far for some writers. Like it's too much work, it's too hard. I don't understand. So in this point, we are going to move your characters from the background to the forefront because we are making them a main character. Too often, marginalized voices, diverse communities are pigeonholed to the background or pigeonholed to stereotypes and tropes that everyone is familiar with instead of getting the driver's seat. So this character you are creating, if you ever write this story, they are going to be the protagonist. So in order to make them the main character, we are going to look at how their identity affects their character or who they are as people. This is how we move out of tokenism. We are going to look at your character's diverse identity and how it affects or shapes their perspective in the following areas relationship, culture, traditions, upbringing and parenting, religion and beliefs, and personal values. You'll have time to work on this at the allotted three minutes, but to further explain what I mean by this, our identities influence every part of our lives. It influences the way we think, the way we act, the way we operate, the way we believe, the way we perceive the world. Something about our identities will affect everything else. Everything is connected. So in this, we are going to look at specifically, directly, how the diverse identity that I assigned at the beginning to your character, how that identity influences or shapes these areas of their life. Quick example, autism for me definitely affects my relationships because I don't have great social communication skills or knowledge. So all of my relationships, friendships have been strained since I've been alive. My disability my, or my diverse label of autism directly affects my relationship. So when you're thinking about your character, if you were to mention in the beginning of the story that they were this thing and then never mention it again in regards to how it affects things around them, you run the risk of tokenism and just slapping on an identity and not realizing how that identity affects everything else. And then the second thing that we're going to do in this point is we are going to now separate the identity from the character because people are not just one thing. Wow, 
people are multifaceted. For this point, we are we are separating that so that we don't fall more into tokenism and more into stereotypes. We're thinking outside, outside of what that thing is. Who are these people? Who is this person besides the label that I gave? So think about how their identity affects was the first assignment. And then the other is how it doesn't and how just how they are. Just who are they? Who are these people? Think about hobbies, interests, personality, fears, likes and dislikes, mannerisms, all of those things that can be influenced by that diverse identity, but it also cannot be. So I want to focus on areas that it's not so that we don't fall into things like stereotypes, tropes, and negative things like that. So if all of that makes sense, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and move on to my example for my character, Noel. And you're going to have three minutes to further develop your character, both connected to their diverse identity and unconnected to their diverse, diverse identity. So here's my example. In relation to his assigned identity, which was gay, um, relationships, I said he, he's faced bullies at school and therefore he has a tight circle of friends. His upbringing and parenting, his parents are very supportive and loving and, and it's made him more open. I uh, discussed his religious beliefs, his personal values, all that could be influenced by his sexual orientation. And on the other side, I have character and just things that I just pulled out of the air that he could like. Things about him, he's a competitive swimmer, things like that. They have nothing to do with the identity that I gave him, but it just it's just him as a person. I hope all of that makes sense. This just came into my head. If I have said anything throughout this video that has been offensive to any community, please let me know. I am open to being corrected and learning and growing. So if I've ever said anything throughout this video that does not sit well with you, I would like you to please let me know because I don't want to be offensive to anyone and I am open to learning and growing. So I just wanted to make sure I said that. And I'm going to go ahead and give you your three minutes so you can flesh out your characters, adding in things connected to their identity and things unconnected to their identity. So three minutes, go ahead. All right, so the last section that we are going to look at is intersectionality and putting everything that we have learned so far together and further deepening our characters. So what is intersectionality? By definition, intersectionality is the interconnected nature of social categorizations, such as race, class, and gender, as they apply to a given individual or group 
regarded as creating overlapping and, and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. So why am I mentioning it here? I want to drive home the point that you can't just slap on a race, a sexuality, a gender onto your characters and call it representation because their identity influences other parts of their character, other parts of their personality, other parts of who they are as a person. Someone who is black and disabled has a much different experience than someone who is simply black or somebody who is white and disabled. There are different levels of oppression, if you will, or discrimination or differences that come into play with a person's identity. They're never just one thing. Different races, religion, language, income, sexual orientation, age, culture, disability, all of these things and more all work together to influence who that person is as a complete individual. The main thing I want to drive home in this final point as we're thinking about diversity, as we're thinking about creating our characters, is that they are not simply one thing. We're going to move away from tokenism and figure out exactly how our character's diverse identity affects who they are in different areas of their life, which we did in the last point, but also how different areas such as culture, age, sexual orientation, something outside of their assigned diverse label influences who they are as a person. This, I feel like, deepens your character. It makes them real. So you just have to think about all of the factors that make someone diverse. It is about so much more than race or sexuality or disability. It is so much deeper than that, and all of it is interconnected. People have layers. Yes, like ogres and onions and parfaits. You need to think about each level of this person's identity and how they are interconnected and how one influences and shapes the other. Because that is, that is the big thing. To me, that's what makes a character real. That's what makes me connect to them as a real person and not just a caricature. So I say all of that to say that diversity is not an inconvenience. It's not about being woke. It's not an option. It's not about political correctness. It's not about meeting a quota. It is not simply race or sexuality. It is so much more. And it is important. And representation matters. And making your characters into real, whole human beings by not mentioning mentioning it once and then never mentioning it, mentioning it again, or never having it influence any other part of their life or of their personality or of the story or their relationships. That to me is not believable because my autism definitely influences my relationships. It influences how I be, how I behave, how I act in certain situations. So a character autistic who presented like me in a conversation with people she feels comfortable with versus a conversation of where she's overstimulated in, in an environment that she cannot handle is going to be monumentally different. And even if the forefront of the story is not that character's disability, you still need to make mention of it throughout the story because it influences every aspect of that person's life. And that to me is creating a full person a full character. So we are going to bring this down a little bit to a close and move on to your last assignment. And we are going to use the different intersectional categories to spend the last three minutes adding more depth to your character. If you can, think about how these overlapping categories shape your character's experience. So I gave a little bit of example before, but I will use my character's example. Here we have Noel. He has a face now. He's a fully fledged human being. Still, we need, there's still probably more that we could dive into, but he is looking good. Um, we got a story idea. We got his background. We got how his uh, diverse 
label as as gay influences these those areas of his life. We have who he is just as a person, who what hobbies, interests he has. And then at the bottom is the new information that I've added. So I added his socioeconomic class, his race, his culture, his disability, his mental wellness, his income, his gender, his sexual orientation, his geography. And if I was to further expand this character, I would look at the ways that those categories influences his his thoughts, influences his personality or his outlook on life because it does. And it is important to making your characters full human beings. So I'm going to give you this final three minutes and you are going to flesh out your characters a bit more. I will go ahead and go to the timer. So you have three minutes to flesh out your characters based on their, on all of the intersectional labels. All right, and that is time up. And we have reached the end of my writing diverse characters presentation. I want to thank you all so much for writing along with me and, and being here today. Uh, I hope that I was able to give you a little bit more insight into writing diverse characters, why it's important and what goes into crafting a full human being in your stories. So I hope that this was educational and also fun. 
I l really like the character in the story that I came up with. I'm thinking about actually writing it. So I hope maybe you created some character that you're excited about writing. And with that, we are going to go ahead and open the floor for the Q&A session. So I'm going to go read my starred comments and we will get started answering the questions you all have. All right. <laughs> so that was the end of the presentation. If anyone has any uh, other questions, um, please go ahead and drop them. I already started about seven, so I'm going to go ahead and start with um, Lauren's question. Um, so she asked, can I explain why in book one of my trilogy that I decided to cure Viv's eyesight instead of making her a blind character? And I was excited to answer this question because honestly, I think that's was a prime example of growth and learning because I wrote that story probably, I think I finished that story in 2019. And then when I published it, I don't think I thought about how that would be erasing her disability. So essentially I was kind of erasing my, my diverse character or my disabled character. Um, there are other disabled characters in that trilogy. Um, but yeah, essentially I did the thing that I'm saying not to do, but I'm also, uh, that's, that's also to say that when I wrote that book, I did not have any, I didn't have much outside feedback with, um, that character. So I didn't have the sensitivity readers or the beta readers. So I think that is why I didn't, I didn't notice it. When I went back after like learning things, I did notice that I kind of killed off, not killed off, but like erased my disability representation. So I wouldn't do that now, but I kind of feel like it's already written. So I can't, I can't really <laughs> go back and change it. Okay. Dang, I already spoke for two minutes. Okay, <laughs> thoughts on sensitivity readers. You need them. You should have them. You should hire them because it is work and it is labor, especially if something, if it's something like traumatic or that would be trauma in, inducing, such as like if you are writing an experience story about, you know, a character's experience that could be traumatic for the sensitivity reader. So, I just think it's nice to pay people for their labor. So, yes. Uh, let's see, my fear is is excuse number two. I have been hired to write a romantic suspense with the interracial couple, and I worry that I won't do the female justice. I love that you're doing this topic. Okay, and so that, I hope I've eased some of your fears or gave you some tips on how you can lessen that fear. And I, I... I speak to the practicing makes perfect and finding people you can trust to tell you um, if you're doing something that's, that might be wrong. Okay. Do you have any reading recommendations that show marginalized characters portrayed? Well, um, just because I just read this book, uh, Blood Like Magic, I just finished it. Lizelle Sanberry. Sanberry? Yes. So I don't have a lot of book rec recommendations just because I've been in a reading slump, but that is the, the last book that I read. And I loved all of her characters and she had a lot of different types of people um, represented in it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm speaking quick because I'm trying to get through all the questions. Um, any advice on where to find sensitivity readers? I would say friends uh, would be one. And then people were talking in the chat uh, about Kofi and getting together a list of people who do sensitivity reader services. So if that gets going, you can look there. But besides like asking people that you actually know that you're friends with, I don't know how to get sensitivity readers because again, I've only have one book out and I did not use any should have, but I didn't use any sensitivity readers with them with that book. So I don't have experience with working with them for like my public, my published stuff. So 
more on that at some other point. Okay, and I did want to answer this question. I do want to ask, um, how can I explain someone's labels without becoming a lecture, breaking up the story? As some writers might say, autistic character, time to explain everything about how it works, especially if the story isn't primar primarily about it. Okay, and for this, I say, you need to integrate it into the story itself. So like I was saying in the example, if I was in a fantasy story and something was going on, let's say, okay, I'm very like sound sensitive or light sensitive. All you have to do is mention it as it becomes relevant. The character can say that they're autistic or somebody can say that they're autistic. And then as the story goes on and as the character is interacting in the world, all you would need to do is make the information relevant as the story progresses. So if they have, if they struggle with light and sound and some loud thing happens, that's where you can mention it. So you, so you don't have to say like, this is how autism is and this, you don't have to lay it out. All you have to do is talk about how that person presents and what their triggers are for either them being overstimulated or their movements, their body movements or anything like that. So anything that is a different diverse label, I feel just needs to be integrated into the story as it becomes relevant. Another example for that is like, I have Crohn's disease. I can't eat popcorn. If a character had Crohn's disease, couldn't eat popcorn, even if the story was not about Crohn's disease. Say she goes to the movies with her friends, they get popcorn, and all she says is, man, last time I ate that, I had a bowel obstruction, had to go to the hospital, I'm not doing that again. And you, they move on. We're reminded that the character has Crohn's, but we don't need to know every single thing about Crohn's in order to, to for the story to, to make sense. Does that make sense? So make it relevant to the story as it's relevant to the character. I hope that makes sense. Okay, I've read all of my starred comments. <laughs> so let me go back and see what y'all were saying. Yay, thank you, thank you. Please write that story. I think I will miss most of this. We'll catch the replay. Love um, that ownership you're taking. Great question, Lauren. Yeah, it was a great question. Because when I saw it, I was like, oh, I just did the thing <laughs> I said not to do. But I did it in the past. So that shows that I learned. <laughs> um, what about healing someone with a terminal illness? Is the il is the illness healable in the, in the regular world? Like, I don't know. That's... Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, do, I don't typically like magical healings um, because of what I just did and just like erasing the uh, disability, like this, this, the disabled representation. So I don't know how I feel about that. Okay. I mean, breeze through the comments. Okay, own it. You're you learn from it, and you're going to continue learning. Yes. Um, great video on Encanto and disability. What talks about this? Cool. Okay, I have a minute left, so I'm just gonna breeze through the comments. I want to thank everybody for coming. I was extremely nervous. I thought I would say everything wrong. So thank you all for being here. Um, yes. And Lauren, if you would like to be one, I will pay you because I do have a blind, uh, Shaw sister is blind. Um, so I would like some sensitivity reader for that. But yes, I will be hiring sensitivity readers for the rest of my books. Okay, there's a lot more comments. I gotta wrap it up though. I'm trying to stay on time and I gotta pick up my husband. So, <laughs> We're going to get off of here. I'm sorry if I missed your comments or your questions, but thank you, everybody. This was so much fun. Enjoy the rest of the author tube writing 
conference. And yes, thank you for being here. Bye.